We talk about very specific things in engineering or science, and we tend to pull things apart. And this is one of the first settings where I've seen us really focus on the integration of what STEAM really means. Um, and then that application. And what I really love about this panel that we have today is that the application goes beyond what we normally think of STEAM in terms of you know, what an engineer does or, or how they use STEAM elements to do their job, but really talking about the social impact that, that STEAM can have. Um, and so to do a quick intro of the speakers or if, if folks have information, I know you already have all of our bios. Should we just dive into these questions? The short 30 second introduction. Um, so I myself, my name is Paula Garcia Todd. Um, I am a chemical engineer. I've spent the last 18 years in the pharmaceutical space, um, but I'm heavily engaged with schools, um, very specifically on STEM and STEAM outreach activities. Um, I'll pass it over to uh, Sharita next. And my name is Sharita Castro, and I consider myself to be a social science researcher who deals in public policy with training in public health and social work at the intersection of trade and labor. So it requires a lot of creativity to pull all those disciplines together, but I've been working for the last 20 years to end child labor, forced labor and human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Afua, I'll let you go next. Uh, thanks so much for having me today. My name is Afua Bruce. I'm currently the Chief Program Officer at Datakind, which is a nonprofit that uses uh, data science and AI to help other nonprofits and government agencies really execute their mission. I um, consider myself to be a public interest technologist. I've spent most of my career really working at the intersection of technology, policy, and communities. And so it's that interdisciplinary nature, that interdisciplinary perspective that I bring to all of my work and um, I'm excited to chat about in today's conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Whittle, you're up. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a a computer engineer involved in building, developing new classes of memories. My research is in cognitive systems now, and we build building various things for space in extreme environments. Um, I was also vice president for education uh, in uh, the largest technical organization, it's the IEEE. Uh, it's 430,000 members. Um, they were, um, those issues were central and focal and strategic to the development of that organization. There is lots of skill, lots, many of opportunities, but the bottom line why I'm here today is we are still working on STEM. STEAM is hard. Uh, STEM for me is like STEM cells. Um, fundamental to all of the developments, but stem cells die without the, its environment. Uh, steam provides the power, that uh, gluing force. So that will be my perspective today, how we could implement it, not think about it, but it starts from thinking that A provides, as you mentioned, the responsibility, the sense of the environment, the sense of co-existing and co-evolving life. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. So before we start getting into the, the real detailed, you know, information to share here, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, how, how do, you know, we'll integrate, you know, how do we integrate this in the classroom, but I'd like to better understand how these disciplines are integrated in the real world. So I'd love to understand some examples, either through personal experiences, careers, studies that you've encountered that beautifully bring together STEAM and humanity. And what is the impact of these uh, partnerships? I'll let anyone pop in. Um, I'm happy to, to kick us off today. Um, so as I said, I work at um, a nonprofit organization that really harnesses the power of data science and AI in service of humanity. So it's um, super uh, intrigued by your prompt. And so, um, you know, as I look at how we integrate technology or specifically in this case, data science um, and AI uh, for that humanity, humanity perspective, it really all comes back to how do we center communities? How are we thinking about 
the needs of communities? How are we defining the communities that we serve? And then how are we making sure that the technology that's out there and that's been developed is getting into the hands of people um, to actually improve life and um, help uh, improve agency uh, for those communities? So a couple of the uh, projects that I find especially interesting that Datakind has done that really speaks to this is we partnered um, with an organization in Haiti uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, that delivered uh, sanitation um, devices, toilets essentially to Haiti. And uh, they had a complicated distribution route um, that they were using to deliver those. So we partnered with them to look at all the data available on the ground and figure out how to uh, create a route optimization um, algorithm um, that uh, anyone could pick up. It didn't have to be an experienced driver or one who's familiar with there. They could pick that up. They could get instructions in the ways that were best for them, whether it be a text or some other form, um, and they could make the best delivery routes. And uh, that organization then reported that uh, because of the algorithm we developed, they saw a 13% decrease in um, their fuel consumption, which given the cost of fuel and the time, right, that's a huge savings for that organization. And so really when you talk about impact and you talk about um, combining sort of the STEM disciplines with sort of the creativity of really saying what actually needs to be done here, what actually needs to be developed, and then that real impact of people getting the sanitation devices they need and organizations saving um, time and money so they can operate more efficiently. I think that's one uh, sort of real world example of how we were able to bring um, all aspects together. That's well, awesome. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Thank you. Go ahead. Please. Yeah, happy to jump in? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, for me, it's it's been a privilege to shape policies and programs in an evidence-based manner to address child labor and forced labor. And I think what drew me into the field of research, specifically social science research, was this deep understanding that data can tr truly change the world. It can inform and transform how we treat each other as human beings and show how we fulfill or fail at that social contract we have with one another. And I think, you know, for me, there was many things that pulled me into the field of research, but the one guiding star was the principle that all children should grow up with love and opportunities to have their dreams come true. And I was able to um, be part of a community of scientists who believed that if we can measure it, we can help raise awareness, um, develop policies and change it. And so um, when I was coming up in the field in 1995, researchers came together to measure child labor. Um, you know, they used first a representative sample of perhaps five countries um, to develop what they called a global estimate, you know, on child labor. But the, the idea was like, you know, while it could have re it received criticism, you had to start somewhere. And in that starting and experimenting and putting um, a number out there over the years, 90 national child labor surveys were able to be administered um, with the help of the International Labor Organization, funding from the US government to have more precise estimates on how to tackle child labor. And so over the last 20 years, our field was able to see a decline by 30%. Um, and sadly, you know, these last global estimates that came up, child labor actually increased by 8 million. So it provides a guidepost about how we as scientists contribute to um, taking care of each other in the world, especially children. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Paula, I, I, I uh, you know, th those kind of uh, considerations uh, just uh, 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 let me, uh, put me in, in a state of uh, remembering what, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I am from Politecnico Milano. And, uh, and so I, I, maybe I put on the, uh, on the table a, a few experiences that uh, we, we shared a, a few years ago 
uh, uh, I mean, for, uh, for instance, for uh, crowd mapping, to give you an example, how, how people, everyday people can, can have uh, a, co a cooperation, a collaboration with university. And so we used, uh, for, for instance, Google mapping uh, for the uh, Milano, Milano area. And then uh, now we have uh, high technological tools that are our, our smartphones. So we asked a group, group of students uh, just to go around and put the, the information on, on Google map on, on local uh, stores. So you have an, an example of integration of, uh, of, you know, of collaboration from university and uh, everyday people because, you know, they, they were just students going around with their smartphones and just uh, writing down, uh, you know, the, what, what they, uh, for instance, uh, uh, considered important to put on, on the map. And so in that way, we were able to have a, a, a more detailed information on 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 on, the, on that area, and that is just a simple example of uh, of opening up, you know, the the university landscape uh, with the connection to everyday life. The second one is is a, a completely different because uh, 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 a year ago. We started an experiment at the university at Polytechnic Milan, and we started a, a, a new area that is uh, a, an area that uh, is taking cons in, into consideration uh, philosophers and sociologists. And, uh, and they, they, they created a group called Meta, and they start uh, with the seminars on epistemology and sociology. And, and then uh, try to let uh, engineers, uh, chemical people, uh, technical people, just try to, to, to talk to one another with the sociologists and, and philosophers. And, and, uh, and then uh, uh, they use that experience to uh, create startups uh, in research groups with some co uh, one constraint that you can st uh, you can have a startup but you have a, in the research group you have to take a, a, a philosopher one philosopher or one sociologist with you in the research group integrated together and this experiment started a year ago and now I'm quite curious to see the results because, uh, you know, they started uh, uh, writing a lot of papers, uh, putting you know, on the on the uh, on the journals on the, on, on, on with the, all the all the bibliographical references or something like like that. But I think that uh, uh, I mean it's, it's something very advanced for for uh, standard university, you know, uh, right now. But that is just, a, for me, is a little example, because as I, I said before, uh, we have to enlarge, uh, to enlarge our panorama, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's the, the point. I mean, uh, uh, STEAM for me is, is, or the shift from STEM to STEAM is just an opportunity to rethink the way we capture knowledge from experience. Because uh, uh, we have to understand that uh, uh, our uh, learning uh, is experiential. And, 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 and we need exper experiential uh, uh, and, and dictionary, uh, uh, both of them are the same way to be able to communicate. We have to develop a common language but the common language by, by itself is nothing if we don't share experience, the same experiences. You know, because yes. of, yeah, because we need we need to give the same meaning to 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 the, to the same words. 
Yeah, thank just you for to, that. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, Wittol, do you have yes, do you have anything just to, to follow add up to this? exactly on, yes. on uh, the previous experiences? I want to share eight experiences very, very briefly, so highlights only. Um, eight because I had quite a few years to actually practice it. All my life was to share. And now I have grandchildren. Um, and uh, they're growing to, I'm growing with them. So it is the, the process of coexistence and co-learning, of finding what we already know and sharing po with possibility of finding and discovering um, the new that we did not see before. It is uh, removing the blindness or getting better glasses so that we could see in, in focus. So one of the first one, maybe 50 years ago, I established a mini university for uh, primary school students and developed some programs. And But it was a coexistence of all of the, um, not mono university, it's the multi university and trans university to discovery in a very fertile ground of what could be. And there are tremendous experiences from it. So mini university, um, the other component was much more serious. I started building when we uh, knew and the environment was very good. We started calling students from home to come to our space camps. We built rockets, launched rockets, built the, all of the elements of realizing that out there, there is no air, we can't breathe. We, out there, there is radiation that kills. We have developed uh, experiments with tardigrades, for example, those animals that have six lives, they can survive 5,000 uh, radiation, 5,000 times stronger than we could. Our cells would fall apart, they don't. The question was why? What is happening over here? Uh, is nature really defined by ourselves or are there alternatives? And how to see the alternatives, how to see the depth of nature already? Um, another most important probably event is I spent most of my life helping indigenous students um, that normally see themselves as worth nothing. Those words came to me so hard so many times that I knew I could not sit and pay attention to people, uh, to, to students whose parents could provide or everything or many things. So. Uh, with, we had a professor, indigenous professor, who got lots of money, established a foundation, and we started with four students. Today we have 150. Six universities are involved. It is the discovery week that I call it. They go to medicine, to zoology, to uh, engineering, and we also build robots that can be done by them can go and things. I've been working very, very hard. One of our provinces in the north is called Nunavut. It's an indigenous province. We had no interest in engineering. After one of those discovery weeks, there was a um, paraplegic type of a student who came and discovered herself. She had to, when she presented to the whole university, she said, I, everybody told me I was worth nothing. And that was the last time that I would agree with that. Uh, now I know. The next year, we had 30 students from her province joining in the University of Manitoba, the place where I am. So the miracles do happen because of those activities, because of STEAM, no longer STEM. Uh, there are many other things. Um, women in science and engineering, uh, we are reaching through that organization 53,000 students each year in a single province. So those are the, the, the power, that's the power of presence and doing the right things. And then uh, since my time is limited, I will then zoom on two, two things. One is um, radio. I'm a ham radio operator. 
um, from the time when that's how students from a university could talk to their parents. There was no telephone. Uh, telephones were too expensive. I taught how to do that even in Morse code because that was the, fast, the fastest way, the cheapest way. And I I'd built a radio transmitter, uh, one could really carry in the pocket and a key that could really be used. And it, almost no power could reach New Zealand. Uh, and and uh, uh, China and uh, Russia. So those are the things that can be done. Those are the things that people discover, not only science and technology, but the connectivity, connecting with others, connecting in a way that STEM cannot provide. And the last one, uh, we have developed now a low Earth orbit satellites and systems group that is working towards now engaging universities and engaging in competitions, colleges and high schools. Um, uh, we've developed now six generations of satellites and the fifth and sixth high school students are now involved. Why? Because in the previous generation, teachers learned how to do it. I cannot be everywhere, but we can uh, be with those leaders and this session is about leadership in STEAM. So it is the infecting others with the zest of learning with the and, and the desire to share their abilities to entice this. I call it the new, the 10th Sputnik 1 moment where we knew something special has happened. And students are eager the smiles when they discover something overshadow any difficulty, any number of hours we could really, we have to put into capturing their hearts and minds. Or let's reverse it, minds. But without the hearts, what do we have? So that's a sharing of, of experience, my hands-on experience. And then, as Rodolfo mentioned, this is the experiential learning. It is not that I put Maxwell's equations and explain them fully. I do that, even in those um, outreach activities, those connectivity activity, not only in my classroom. But it is the other component that brings that smile that lasts almost forever, from that crib to the last handshake or the last smile that we can give. Perfect. Thank you so much. That that segues really well into the next question that I had, which is really talking about all, all these real world applications that we're talking about and how do we bring them into classrooms. So I think you had some wonderful examples in there. I'd love to hear from any other panelists, you know, what are other ways that you can connect these career paths or or these STEAM principles into the classroom? And since we're told you kind of went into this as well, I'd love to also hear any thoughts about how do we better include underrepresented students into STEAM as well? Like what are other ways that we can really engage with those students to consider STEAM? Any Maybe thoughts? just uh, so very quickly, um, one of the most difficult uh, components in engaging indigenous students is homesickness. Uh, moving to other places uh, may last only for a day or two. We have to now develop an infrastructure, the new environment, the new ecosystem that would be supportive. So we've also included now chaperones, people from their families who come with them. And uh, you can see what happens. Not only the students learn, but their families. It is not what the student says or shows, but now what the individuals who care for the individual students can do. So it is no longer in isolation, sending someone to a school. And to the best teacher on the planet will not do it because in a day, in my case, even six hours, we had to fly the individual back because they could not survive. They cried rather than participate and smiled. So it is an ecosystem that we have to develop. In my slides, that will be addressed as a fundamental issue. Thank you. Thank you. Great, any other panelists? Any other thoughts? Um, go ahead, I'm yeah. happy to build on that a little. And I think one of the things uh, that you can do to really connect to students is 
to ask them what they're interested in, right? When I um, go into classrooms and have these conversations, I don't, I, you know, I might start with a little bit of background about myself, but then really ask the students for what are you seeing in your own world? What are you seeing that you want to change in the world? Um, what do you like to think about? What do you like to dream about? And then from there, we can figure out what sort of scheme specific tools you have, but just getting students to, instead of focus on um, sort of the particular tool that they're going to use to solve the problem, what the actual problems are that they're trying to meet. And I think when you start from there, then you can have more engaging conversations. Then you can help students develop projects that they are excited about, that they want to do, that they want to spend their time on. And then they'll learn the science or the technology or the art or the engineering or the math skills that they really need to bring to bear for that problem. There's an organization um, in uh, North Carolina, I'm forgetting the particular city, called Code the Dream that does this really well. Um, they uh, they tend to work with mostly adults, but they really seek to bring in people who are from historically um, underrepresented or overlooked communities and uh, teach them technical skills, but also say, what are the problems that you're looking to solve? And so that's really led to people saying, you know, I wonder if there's a way that we can build something that works with um, the state to figure out how we can automatically clear, um, automatically get people their life driver's licenses back when um, they're eligible for something that uh, pays outstanding fines. And then they can get their driver's license back in their hands and then they can drive again, they can support their families, they can drive to a job, things like that. Or people um, have, who've come into that program who are from migrant farm worker communities who say, you know, the problem that we're actually seeing is how do people get services? How do people make sure there's clothing and food and more? And so now that that's the problem, what are the different tools that we can bring together to bring communities together, to serve communities, and to actually then get that food and that clothing to the people who need it in those migrant farm worker communities? So I think it really starts with having conversation with students, having conversations with people about what are the problems that you're seeing? What do you want to change? And then we can figure out the, the tools and techniques from there. Yeah, I love that because you're really starting with the heart. And then from the heart, you move into like true social impact using STEAM. So that, that's, that's amazing. Charita, did you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Paula. I'd, I'd like to, to share a few things as well, just coming from, you know, lived experience. And, you know, if you were to have told my mother when I was in elementary school that her daughter would be uh, one of the inaugural, if then a uh, STEM ambassador, she would have laughed. She's like, but she just likes to play. And, you know, I think, um, so in, in honor of today, I, I'm wearing these hearts. <laughs> uh, as you talk, you all talk about connecting with the heart because, um, you know, I, I grew up with various things around me and messages. And um, it's funny because when I was growing up, I, I remember I just loved to draw hearts. And at one point, one of the teachers sort of offered this challenge. She's like, well, maybe you can draw your name and not draw hearts anymore. And I, I remember it was my first, um, I guess my first form of resistance. And I studied my name. I, had to, I actually hadn't fully studied my name until I was like in the third grade. And I was like, I'm gonna show her, my name means charitable. I'm gonna draw hearts everywhere. And, but I think there were like these two parallel paths of, um, you know, I grew up actually in a family because whether it was poverty and stability, that one way out is that you will go through to the sciences. And so, of course, whenever your parents tell you to do something, you want to run the other way. And so I think other messages I was hearing was that, oh, Charita is the playful one. She doesn't really, uh, she's not studious. And, um, you know, I kind of believe that or was like a happy-go-lucky. But th the reality is that science was taught in a way, you know, in terms of, physical sciences, but sort of devoid from the human aspect. Like what can science do? How can you use science to actually help humanity? And I think that when a teacher, one of my um, college, not just my college professors, but one, it was um, my seventh grade high school teacher she made learning fun. 
And I remember just that fun in the learning made me want to do better in class because I also wanted to please her. Um, but then, you know, as I came along and I had other women um, educators in my life who connected the science aspect, the quantitative, hard sciences, statistics to here's how you can help humanity. That's kind of what brought me along. And I think one of the things that I just kind of want to share or challenge is that we talk about A, you know, as in the art aspect, as is the experience of STEM is not art in and of itself, right? Like I went for this panel and I looked at what is the definition of art? And it's like a visual object or experience consciously created through an expression of skill or imagination. And so this is just to say that um, we like to put artists in one box, scientists in one box, um, but scientists are artists. And uh, part of it is like, how do we bring that creativity and learning to life in a way that engages the heart and the soul? Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So um, we've, we've covered a lot. Um, we're running short on time. I'm going to move into my last question. And the way that I've pulled my last question together is based on a recent NSF study that showed that there are certain aspects or certain elements of STEM education that absolutely need to be incorporated into classrooms for various reasons. And as I was reading through this research, it really struck me that these are really critical in bringing together STEAM and humanity as we've been talking about here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to give you some of these elements and I'm going to go ahead and define it for the audience. And then I'd love to hear your take of the importance of having this being taught into a classroom setting and the potential impact that it has in really pulling together STEAM and humanity. Okay, so I'm going to start with data literacy, which I think a couple of the panelists, actually all of the panelists would agree very important in their fields, right? And so data literacy is defined as the ability to identify, collect, evaluate, analyze, interpret, and communicate data. So what do you think is the impact and the importance of data literacy in integrating STEAM and humanity? So one of, oh. Um, so one of my um, mentors used to say uh, that um, behind every uh, number is a name and behind every name is a story. And I think about that a lot in the data work that I do, right? You're always looking at all these tables of different numbers. You're looking at what's the different data you're thinking about. Is this data representative? Is it inclusive? Is it exhaustive? Have we over collected data? But just, and then, you know, you use all of that to maybe do some predictive analysis or to make some recommendations or to draw some type of analysis or uh, recommendations from that data. And I often try and remind myself that for all of this, all of these numbers that I'm looking at, all of these words that I'm looking at, whatever that data uh, is looking at, um, that really it's all representative of people with stories and lives. And it's really just trying to connect to that and back to the conversation we're having about connecting the heart to, um, to the science. That's that's what it's all about. So that, that for me is the data literacy to uh, humanities connection. Very impactful. Olaf? Thank you. Yes, we're told. Oh, of, of course, a statement was so beautiful that I, <laughs> I almost started crying over here because <laughs> this is the core of what we want to accomplish. It is that um, finding the forces that bind us, not divide us, something that is beyond everything. That's the meta understanding of it. Now, without data, coming back to the, exactly the point that you made, um, we are almost nothing because we would be blind. We will live, but we don't know where we are going and we will hit more obstacles than we would like to for our well-being. So the well-being depends on, on the data. Um, I teach how to acquire data correctly, how to bring uh, translate the data from the environment uh, here on the planet and in space to uh, collect them, 
transmit without too many errors, then collect them somewhere in the oceans, data oceans and data lakes and the data transformations uh, and the transformers and then start analyzing. But as uh, Rodolfo very often said, that our data analysis is based on statistical uh, sense and statistics. Statistics um, rely now on frequency. So that's the frequentist type of an approach. If something is very frequent, uh, say in language, or we say it will appear everywhere. But what does it mean? The meaning is uh, that specific frequentist approach and statistical approach is void of meaning. The semantics is lost. So we have to now look into more then and um, say Bayesian analysis um, and the relational analysis is not sufficient either. We have to find now and artificial intelligence as it is not only is insufficient but has led to the equating untruth with truth, one of the most dangerous evol evolutions in human beings and due to test, uh, disconnected science and technology and math without the uh, realization that we, our lives, our living, co-evolving living depends on the truth. Science is about searching and dis dis discriminating or discerning between truth and, and not so but definitely uh, falsehood and misinformation and disinformation. Today, we must get help in it. It has to move into patents, but patents themselves are not sufficient either. So we have to look about patents, about patents, and may, maybe even further, patents, 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 wheels within wheels within wheels, Wheels, as you remember, the beautiful songs that have been created, um, story um, <clears throat> about the fools and clowns uh, and others. So we have to see beyond statistics. We want to see beyond patterns that are obvious. Patterns uh, based on frequency also are even, even more dangerous because falsehood becomes the most frequent thing that may occur in our lives. So data are absolutely completely things, but data that are false will create even greater da dangers to humanity. So we must now address this. So NSF and others have been working extremely hard in order to find ways of doing it and that those ways do exist, but maybe we have to have new views, rethink how we could really fight this information. We are incapable of fighting. You can't be analyzing uh, PETA or uh, EXA type of uh, bytes of data. We, our brains are not capable of doing it, but we can see through. What does it mean seeing through? Mm -hmm. This is now the level that goes beyond statistics. Well, if you okay. don't mind, I'd like to comment on what Witold has said, uh, Paula yes. Mitoko. Yeah, I just want to underscore some of the things that Witold has shared and also Afua. You know, I, I come from a public policy perspective and, and, and also science. And so I think one of the greatest public policy challenges of our time, one of the greatest um, research challenges of our time is truly how to tackle misinformation, disinformation, and create a research agenda that advances STEM for good. And part of that is figuring out how we put people, whether it's people, our planet, democracy, over profit. And I come from a public policy training um, where you know, we study the politics of data and you know, one of the, the pioneers in the field, Deborah Stone, in talking about policy paradox and talking about how there are no neutral facts. You know, every piece of data has a, a judgment about how do you measure, how do you analyze? Um, and I think that part of 
the education and data literacy that needs to be integrated into classrooms is, um, yeah, so going back to the question of data literacy, that it is essential that statistics, data li literacy, you know, to foster um, constructive critical thinking exists within a classroom. And part of that critical thinking has to couple STEM with our history um, and the history of colonialism, the history of slavery, all of these dark histories that people are not wanting uh, to think about. So um, yeah, just kind of wanting to, to, to make a plug to pair STEM and history as we foster data literacy. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, those are all very insightful comments. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm going to go to another aspect that came out of this research. And Rodolfo, when you talked about your examples, this one really kind of reminded me of this one. So I'm going to mention this one, which is dynamic interdisciplinary teaming which is defined as the ability to function in and contribute to a variety of team groups, the ability to collaboratively set common goals and progress towards them, the ability to contribute expertise and learn from others, the ability to learn from and work within a global context, unrestricted, unrestricted by geography and respectful of diversity. What are your thoughts on that particular element, the importance, the impact in the classroom, especially when it comes to STEAM in, in the humanities? May may add just a few lines because uh, I think that uh, we uh, we have to be aware of, uh, of a further, further distinction because uh, uh, when we talk about data literacy, uh, usually your mind go immediately to computers. But uh, again, uh, we have to make a distinction. And, and, and if you like, you can refer to Nora Bateson, yeah, to Nora Bateson blog, uh, just to Google Nora Bateson blog and you go there and look at uh, an article, a fantastic article on talking on war data. I mean, organisms, living organisms are just, you know, uh, very different from, from machines, from computers. And so they use warm data. They, they process your uh, warm data, not just, uh, you know, uh, cold data like you can find on computers. And so, uh, for instance, uh, the, the example that I gave you of uh, uh, in uh, technical people dealing with the uh, philosopher and, and, and sociologists was just the, the, the right opportunity to let them realize the difference between cold data and warm data. Yeah. Yep, yes. absolutely. Yep, yep. That ties both of them together. Absolutely. Any other thoughts about, uh, you know, really working in, in an interdisciplinary team and, and getting effective use out of that team. Paula? Yes. Uh, the reason uh, I selected the hardest of all of the environments, space, uh, building a satellite, is uh, the most important lesson I've learned is that I, I, I know quite a lot, I think I know quite a lot, but there is no a chance that I could build that structure, that system by myself. Not a chance. Uh, if I would ask mechanical engineers, not a chance. If we look ask now scientists, mathematicians, not a chance. We need 16 disciplines, 16, to build a satellite. All of them thought initially that they could build by themselves. That idea uh, of uh, now involving many students. I had 130 students in, in the first generation of the satellite. Uh, they, they just came because it was so exciting. It was the Sputnik type moment. They knew that something could be done that could not be done otherwise. And then they also learned within days, not months, that we need one another. 
not because it is better to be <laughs> two. If one gets sick, the other doesn't. No. Each and every body was needed. This was the example where experience revealed the truth of our living. Our, we, we are not single cell. We are not two cells. We are, for us to do that discussion, we need many cells. <laughs> and also, not just cells acting in isolation, cooperating, being together, becoming one organism. And then that team does the beautiful things that could happen. So there are many examples that steam, no longer stem, is needed to bring everybody to that recognition. And again, that pro such projects do not distinguish between color, color of the skin, religion, observations, views. If they're too distinct, they vanish. They move to other things. It is really that gluing force that can help us in getting into that focus. So complex problems teach us about complexity. That complex engagement teaches us how we must interact to survive together uh, with all of our differences, with all of the changes that we would like to make instantly. No, we are dynamical systems, non-linear, interacting not only within ourselves, but it, between uh, among ourselves in a non-linear fashion. But many, any smile that I see impacts everything I do. Every, cry, uh, every tear that I see impacts what I do. It is definitely non-linear. I can write equations, <laughs> but it is then involves our very fundamental being, being. And then uh, such projects, togetherness, the to togetherness teaches us how to have hope and how the realization in the philosophy of say, tikkum olam, it is how to be to improve, how to have the strength to survive the multitude of tears and the pain that we observe each day. That's my observation over here. I probably won't be able to show you all of the slides, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great response because it also hits into this concept of systems thinking of not just working together in an interdisciplinary manner, but also how the pieces connect and affect each other, which is very important. So, so thank you for bringing that to light uh, as well. And what the impact of it is not just theoretical, practical. We yes. know them that we need one another, not that I have to have a gun to uh, assert my dominance over you or anybody. Paula and Whittle, can I share a story uh, just uh, when we're yes. talking about the, the, the practicality of, of disciplines? And I think it's true, you know, when we're, we're tackling a subject, um, we often need various disciplines and, and that's what makes it stronger. Um, you know, whether it's very diversity in disciplines, diversity in lived experience. And, uh, you know, in tackling child labor, we need lawyers, social workers, economists. And so I just want to share a story where we were trying to collect data um, to assess if there was forced labor in a particular industry. And I was speaking to a lawyer and I said, well, do you know if the study and the process was random, like, was it a random sample? And the lawyer came tell me, oh yeah, 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 it was random. Like we went here, we went there, we went there. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. Like, and so I tried to describe the process of random. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this, um, our training on quantitative methods, methods and what is random and non-random, you, you realize we don't have that shared language. And I think oftentimes, like, you know, Whittled said, as, as we are connected, part of it is making sure we have a shared language, but then also um, uh, respecting the disciplines for where we come from, but then also coming together. Because even in, you know, 
economists and quantitatives were like, oh, what does logit mean? What does probit mean? Um, but in the end, it's like, okay, what are we trying to show? What are we trying to accomplish? And how do we get together to have this shared language to accomplish that same goal? Yeah, that that's a great, great uh, <laughs> story to share. Yes, I think we've all had moments like that and we can relate. So I see we're, we're coming down to time. So um, Fua, did you have any um, lasting words or anything on any of the topics we've covered that you wanted to add on to? Um, I think the only thing that I would close with is um, just echoing actually things that have already been said multiple times in different ways on the panel is just that um, in order to really solve for the solutions that we need for today and certainly for the future, for some of the biggest challenges we're facing um, across humanity, it is an interdisciplinary approach and focusing on um, specific disciplines, even science, technology, engineering, and math versus um, art uh, or different disciplines of science or different disciplines of engineering. You know, we can sort of set those aside because it's really going to take an interdisciplinary approach, perspectives um, from multiple different angles to really uh, work together and solve um, the, the challenges that really affect uh, the heart of the matter and its people's lives. Thank you so much. I think that was a wonderful summary of exactly what we discussed today. So thank you so much. I would love to thank all of our panelists today, um, all of the attendees for listening in. Uh, Rodolfo, thanks again for, for creating the space to allow uh, you know, these conversations to happen through uh, the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, thank you so much. Do you have any other comments to add, Rodolfo? Well, I, for just for closing, I think that uh, we have to create uh, educational ecosystems that uh, uh, able to inspire students and be inspired by them at the same time, and and not just uh, you know a an environment where they are just trying to get in, just to get a certificate, you know, something like that, and. Uh, and so an inclusive education, uh, helping them to understand who they really are, uh, where they want to go, what they want to achieve in their lifetime. That's it. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so we are at time. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>